Hello and thanks for joining us on Chicago Tonight. I'm Brandis Friedman. Here's what we're looking at. Repairing homes and combating neighborhood disinvestment through the arts. History paints a conflicting portrait of Martin Luther King Jr. A definitive new book seeks to clarify that picture. He had the capacity to love those who hated him. And from the WTTW archives, we revisit a revealing 1978 interview with Coretta Scott King about her husband's humor and humanity. And we kick things off right after this. Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by Alexandra and John Nichols, the Jim and Kay Maybe family, the Polk Brothers Foundation, and the support of these donors. In the 1950s and 60s, black families were forced to pay often double or more to buy a home in what was known as contract buying. As a result, instead of earning equity and passing down generational wealth, black homeowners often lost their homes. Now a local artist is highlighting those injustices by working to revitalize vacant lots in Inglewood. It's part of her latest project, Unblocked Inglewood. And joining us now are artist and photographer Tanika Lewis-Johnson and Carla Bruni, pres preservation and resiliency specialist at the Chicago Bungalow Association. Thanks to you both and welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having us. Tanika, let's start with you, please. Where did the idea for Unblocked Inglewood come from? Mm, the idea kind of emerged from a chance meeting with one of the uh, descendants of the aspiring black homeowner couple that was connected to my inequity for sale project. And when I put up the landmark in front of the home, that's when I met their son, uh, Mr. Melvin Walls, who is an older black homeowner that is struggling to get home repairs done. And he introduced me to other residents on the block, and they all had the same story. And then that's when the idea to use art to do a tangible solution for the issues they were facing came about. Carla, because I want to get into, the, uh, get into that more, of course. Carla, what is the Chicago Bungalow Association's role in this project? Right, so we partnered with Tanika on this project. Uh, we do a lot of work around weatherization and repair. And so Tanika is well aware of that and wanted to come together with us so we can take care of sort of the, you know, the things that need to be done before you can start thinking about any sort of beautification or whatever, just getting things back to where they should be. Uh, uh, and Carla, I mean, Tanika, of course, we talk about using art, of course, you being an artist. How do, how do these two things go together? Carla mentioned, you know, making fixes and repairs before beautifying. What, what do you do? Well, first of all, there's a lot of arts funding happening right now to amplify historic issues. And so I really wanted to combine the funding opportunities of the arts with actually solving the issues that arts funders are encouraging artists to create work around. So beyond sculptures, murals, gardens, I wanted to take this as an opportunity to actually solve and using the homes as a form of sculpture, as a form of art, before you can beautify a home and have a collection of homes represent um, an artistic activation on a block, you have to deal with the tangible infrastructure that needs repair. And so that's what I really wanted to do with Unblocked Inglewood. Um, your last project, we talked about inequity for sale. It pinpointed homes, as you said, that were sold under land sale contracts. How has that process or how did that practice uh, lead to the lack of equity for homeowners? in Inglewood alone, for example. So what it did specifically to the aspiring black homeowners in the 50s and 60s, um, it denied them equity that they would have had because they didn't own their home. They didn't have a mortgage. And a lot of people think that's a historic issue that doesn't impact anybody today. But through the story of Melvin Walls, one of the actual Inglewood residents on the block today, he represents so many of us in Inglewood because of the devaluation of the entire neighborhood through this historic discrimination practice you can't afford to get home repair loans because your home is devalued um, it's not worth enough to get a loan or you know um, just the devaluation in general prevents opportunities for homeowners to repair and so that's how it impacts black homeowners today and this project is kind of like a symbol of ways that we can address it um, outside of some 
formal commitment from the city. Uh, Carla, what repairs and work have been done throughout the block so far? Yeah, so we've done quite a lot. Um, we've finished 14 buildings now on the block, um, and I think we have about 12 to go next year. But we've done, we've put a lot of new roofs on. Um, we fixed drywall, ceilings, uh, broken pipes, all kinds of things that we found in walls. And uh, as a result, once those are all sort of taken care of, you can go ahead and weatherize the home too. So they're also insulated, they're much warmer now in the winter. Um, taking care of anything that can help people kind of get through the seasons better as well. Um, Tanika, you just mentioned this, uh, but you know, part of the project is being able to find solutions and you kind of talked about the, the cycle that some people are in with regards to not being able to get a repair loan because the neighborhood is already so invested, uh, disinvested and it's already fallen so far into disrepair. Tell me more about that and, and kind of the trouble that folks have. Um, well, this block in particular represents the struggles of so many, not only in Inglewood, but in other black neighborhoods that have dealt with these historic discriminatory housing practices, is that you can't afford to upkeep your home. And if you can find a way to fund repairs, sometimes it depletes your actual savings. And so it really contributes to this ongoing racial wealth gap. And so this project is hoping to not only amplify how solutions need to be addressed a little bit more creatively, but really how investing in actual black homeowners is good for the entire city. Because in order to create more black homeowners, you really have to support the existing black homeowners. Carla, what are some of the, the challenges that you hear from homeowners about being able to keep up their homes? Um, it's just really cost prohibitive um, and, and also just the energy burden on top of that. So if you have, you know, a leaky roof, um, you know, anytime you're trying to heat or cool your home, it's going to cost you a heck of a lot more, right? So it, it just, everything seems to compound. And then the longer these repairs go, you know, without being taken care of, then um, everything just gets exponentially worse over time and it can just be really overwhelming for people. It seems cyclical, you know, Absolutely. Like it, that keeps yeah. happening. Um, Carla, what have you heard residents say that they would like to see in their neighborhoods? Um, Tanika would also be really good to okay. <laughs> speak to oh, this one. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, not only are they interested in having the structural repairs that Chicago Bungalow Association is helping them receive, but beyond that, they want um, beautification to the exterior of their homes. They want their porches to actually be um, maintained, and they want the vacant lots on the block to consist of um, healing spaces, places for them to sit, because the block actually has a lot of older homeowners and you know they want to hang out in their neighborhood but they want a beautiful space to do that and that's why we're partnering with the Inglewood Arts Collective to help really um, brighten up the block outside of the additional home repairs um, and cosmetic repairs that they want to their house. Uh, you've also got researchers studying this. What are what are we hoping that they'll be able to tell us? Oh, yes, we are working with an amazing researcher, Amber Hindley, and she's actually the lead researcher of the report that My Inequity for Sale project was born out of. And she's helping us kind of quantify the impact of this project um, with the hopes of it being an example of how it can be replicated and the creative ways in which we can fund solutions like this. So she's helping us get the numbers and all of that together so we can present it as something that can be uh, replicated as a cross-sector collaboration with the city, arts organization, residents, and amazing nonprofits like CBA. Yeah, Carla, that was going to be my next question. Do you think we'll be able to see something like this happening on other complete blocks? That's the hope. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we're learning a lot with this project, um, and you know, we're very we're talking to homeowners daily about everything going on. Have a lot of community meetings as well, um, getting a lot of feedback and. So yeah, we really, I mean, we feel like we're, this is a bit of a pioneering project with some unique partnerships, and I mean, that's definitely the hope. And a unique, a unique way of, of, approaching, of approaching the problem by, by going through arts funding. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll have to leave it there, but we look forward to hearing from both of you again as this moves forward, uh, with, if it's able to expand. Tanika Lewis-Johnson and Carla Bruni, thanks to you both. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Of course. Most schools, banks, and public offices were closed today in honor of Martin Luther King Jr. Day. And this year, the federal holiday falls on King's actual birthday. In the 55 years since his death, King is often quoted and revered, an icon himself. But in his new book, King, A Life, author Jonathan Eig draws King as, quote, a man, not a saint, not a symbol, delivering far more nuance than history has allowed. 
We recently sat down with Ike and began by asking him what he wanted to accomplish with his book on the often written about civil rights activist. I wanted to write a more intimate portrait, but also one that restored his true radical nature. You know, one of the things that's happened in the 60 years since the March on Washington and in the 55 years since his death is that we've turned him into a national holiday and a monument, things that he deserves, but in the process we've watered down his message and we've forgotten that he was human. We've forgotten that he struggled, that he had doubts, that he suffered, that he, you know, experienced um, moments of, of uncertainty. And I wanted to write a book that made him feel more relatable. Um, the book includes details from an unpublished memoir written by his father, obviously hugely influential in ML's life, as he was called as a kid. Um, what did you learn about the kind of father that Daddy King, as he was called, uh, the kind of father that he was and how that would influence uh, Martin Luther King Jr. as an adult? Daddy King was a tough guy. He walked off the farm. He was born into a sharecropping family in Stockbridge, Georgia, at the age of 12 or 13, walked off the farm with his shoes tied together and slung over his shoulder so he wouldn't wear them out, walking barefoot toward Atlanta, where he basically reinvented himself. And not only became, not only taught himself to read, but became a pastor and, and took over Ebenezer Baptist Church, but he also made it possible for Martin Luther King Jr. to be who he was, literally renamed him. They were both born Michael King. So renames himself, renames his son, and creates an environment where his son can actually dream of accomplishing the kinds of changes that a previous generation really could only dream about. And we kind of see throughout the book as well, there were times when, you know, you wonder if, if, if ML, if Martin Luther King Jr. was making a decision based on, you know, the, the need to impress his father, or were they kind of competing with each other at some point in some ways. Um, I learned a lot. He plagiarized in his early writings. Um, he had a serious relationship with a white woman before he met Coretta Scott King, and which blows a lot of people away, right? Because as long as we've known them, they've been the unit. Um, obviously, he was ambitious and charismatic, but he was also resistant to elevating the role of women in the movement. He had some extramarital affairs and maybe several um, before, you know, re relationships before marriage as well. Uh, how did you sort of navigate the different images of Martin Luther King Jr.? Well, you summed it up very well. There's a <laughs> lot going on there, and it's hard. You know, he lived only 39 years, but in that 39 years, he packed in so much, and he was a very complicated man. He, you know, was somebody who really didn't like conflict. He's our greatest protest leader, and he doesn't like conflict. And I think some of that comes from his relationship with his father, but you see it with Coretta, too, because Coretta was an activist before they even met. Coretta had more credentials as an activist than he did when they met. And yet, as you pointed out, he was resistant when it came to letting her get involved in the movement. He wanted her to stay home and raise the kids. So I just tried to really lean into all of that complexity and not try to simplify the man. Just let the reader decide for themselves how they feel about his, his weaknesses, his flaws, and how that you know, figures into his greatness because it's all tied together. You also, um, speaking of Coretta, you know, it's also the first biography to use the audio tapes of Coretta Scott King, um, her recounting everything from her first date to preparing uh, for Dr. King's funeral. And that said, I wanted more Coretta and maybe I should go read her book too. Um, <laughs> but what kind of influence was she in his life? I love Coretta. She's such a fascinating person. And I think that the reason King is attracted to her is because she's so strong and she's so outspoken when it comes to activism. When King wins the Nobel Peace Prize, Coretta says, you know, we have a greater responsibility now, not you, we have a greater responsibility to speak out on issues beyond civil rights, to talk about human rights, to talk about eco income inequality, and poverty, war. And it's Coretta really sometimes leading the way. And um, I think that she deserves a lot more credit than she often gets. Um, you write about his time, of course, protesting slums and segregated housing in Chicago um, and his work with local leaders, organizing with Timuel Black, Chicago historian, um, who was at first doubtful of King and his understanding of Chicago's complicated politics. Here is a clip of him speaking on his time here. This is a terrible thing. I've been in many demonstrations all across the South. But I can say that I have never seen, even in Mississippi and Alabama, mobs as hostile and as hate-filled as I've seen in Chicago. Calling Chicago the mob that he saw that day in Marquette Park in Chicago more hate-filled than what he had seen across the Jim Crow South. What did he learn from his time in Chicago? Well, he was told by many of his closest associates not to come here, that he thought, they thought that he didn't know what he was getting into, and that northern racism was... Um, 
more pernicious in many ways because it was better hidden than the racism that he encountered in the South. And I think when King left here, he was deeply frustrated, but he was determined that he was not going to give up. He felt like Mayor Daley was not dealing squarely with him, that Daley agreed to actually meet a number of King's important demands, and then as soon as King left town, those demands were ignored. And, and that's something we live with today. You know, our, that, the legacy of that failure to embrace King's reforms haunts us to this day. Uh, how did his visits to Chicago and then, of course, staying in North Lawndale later on reflect, you know, a shifting movement by then and his place in it? King was very successful by most measures in the South. He, he helped get passage of the Voting Rights and the Civil Rights Act, but he was not satisfied with that. He said that Northern segregation, Northern um, racism was just as bad and needed to be addressed. And when he came here, he lost a lot of his support. You know, a lot of the white Northern liberals who sent money, sent checks to support his work, suddenly lost interest in what he was doing. And the same thing happened when he spoke out about the Vietnam War. We forget that in the last three or four years of his life, King was really fading in terms of his popularity, and people did not really believe in him. Even the March on Washington, 70 percent of Americans were against it. And in fact, John F. Kennedy Jr. told him not to do it. That's or right. not Jr., excuse me, JFK. <laughs> John F. Kennedy <laughs> told him not to do it, that he'd be making a mistake. Yeah, Kennedy was afraid that riots would break out, that it would damage his, his um, support in the South, that he would lose support for any potential civil rights legislation. But King over and over told the people in power that he was not going to wait that you can't keep asking people to wait when you haven't been dealing with them squarely to begin with. Okay, 10 seconds left. Jonathan, what do you want people to take away from this book? I want people to remember that King was a man, that he had moments of doubt, and when you think about him that way, he becomes greater as a hero, and it also means that we can aspire to emulate him because we don't have to be perfect to fight for what we believe in. Again, that was our recent conversation with author Jonathan Eig. His new book is called King, A Life, and you can read an excerpt on our website. And up next, we hear from Coretta Scott King about her husband's playful side and his ability to love those who hated him. And you just heard author Jonathan Eig talk about the importance of Coretta Scott King to the civil rights movement and to her husband. In 1978, WTTW's John Calloway spoke with Mrs. King about her husband, as well as her own role in continuing his legacy. Here's part of that conversation. When you, when you wrote your book, Your Years with Martin Luther King, you speak frequently of a side of him that those of us who were reporters and walked with him in the streets and the fields didn't necessarily see that much, but you speak of his great humor that he had and his interminable basketball games inside, which you couldn't stop. Yeah, Martin had a great uh, sense of humor, and uh, we often wish that people, um, that his f masses of his followers could know him as we knew him. Uh, he was uh, had to be very serious in public, and people get the impression that, uh, you know, you're always serious and, mm -hmm. and meditating. But Martin was just so human. That was one of the things that attracted me to him when I first met him. Uh, he was very serious about it. He says, I was, he says, when I get into the pulpit, when I'm preaching, he says, I'm very serious. He said, I don't play. Uh, but when he was, uh, you know, outside of that context, he was human and playful and very much, uh, you know, he could be uh, as playful as a six-year-old child. I never shall forget the first Sunday I went to hear him preach when we, was, we were courting in Boston. My mother was visiting and... Uh, um, we went to the uh, beach, and uh, I forgot that famous beach in Boston, outside of Boston, but uh, he went for skating, roller skating, and he had so much fun. He was just like a little child, and she had seen him preach that morning in the pulpit, and she just couldn't believe it. She says, he acts like he's about four years old. Uh, but he was just having so much fun, you know, just skating and, and uh, just, being, just being another human being. One of the other great men that, that you wrote about in, in that book was your father. I, I was as moved about the writing about your father as I was practically anything in that book. He had a capacity to work. And you're talking about giving people the simple dignity of, of working. He worked like few men work and had it all taken away from him. Burned down his... Well, yes, my father... Business 
was a, such a strong person and has so much faith, and he's 78 years old today, and he still has that same faith and belief and love for people. Um, he always is willing to forgive and ready to forgive and very understanding. And those qualities were qualities that I found in Martin. And I often said that, you know, they were so much alike, and yet they had such different backgrounds. My father was Southern rural, and he was uh, Southern urban and highly educated. My father only had a sixth grade education. But uh, he was such a great, uh, he is such a great uh, spirit, and, you know, that, that uh, indomitable will and determination to keep on keeping on when there's just nothing, you know, left. I remember the day when our house was burned and when we finally got the message, he had gone to work that day. Mm -hmm. You know, he got up as if nothing had happened, gone on to work. He had and no time or capacity for bitterness, did he? No, no, he has no bitterness. He, he's just such a great forgiving heart. And that's the kind of uh, family, you know, that, you know, I grew up in. and. I had so much, uh, I have so much respect for him, and my, of course, my mother, too. They're both great human beings and uh, gave me my values. Uh, I, uh, I think people are very lucky when they have good parents uh, because uh, children very often, uh, are, well, children are not really responsible because the first six years, I believe, are the most important years of your life. And if you don't have your values instilled early, you know, it's, it's harder to learn them. You may learn them and you may not. But uh, my parents, even though they were, they were poor and they had to struggle uh, against the, the uh, segregation and discrimination of their uh, period, uh, they always believed in the future and that things could be better and that uh, the route to liberation was through an education. And so they gave us the values, my sister and my brother and I, uh, these values that they held. And uh, those values were strengthened as I went on through Antioch College. And when I met Martin in Boston, I had my values and I had my, you know, my commitment. I didn't uh, learn it from Martin. And, but Martin, I think, gave me an opportunity to fulfill it. Uh, it was a great wedding, so to speak. Yes, I values. think it, and I think it was, uh, you know, kind of destined. It was meant to be. Uh, I didn't realize it until later. I think I did realize it after we got to Montgomery uh, and the boycott had started and our house had been bombed. And, you know, there was such a great feeling of something very important happening that was worldwide and we were a part of it. And it was really a very great privilege to be a part of it. I felt, I remember thinking, you know, I feel so fortunate to be here today and to be a part of this and this is the reason why we came to Montgomery. Now I understand. And as we went along in the movement and the drama began, continued to unfold, you, you begin to see uh, more and more. And then you realize that the testing came and you had to be tested over and over again. When Martin was stabbed, that was a testing point in our lives. And you know, each campaign he was criticized and then we continued to be tested. And then when he got the Nobel Peace Prize in the midst of all of that, then there was an attack from Hoover and it was more testing. And then he spoke out against the war in Vietnam and more testing, you know, and all the way throughout his life, you know, so that, you know, someone said it so well, uh, when you're, you know, when you totally commit your life, there's nothing to be puffed up about. They said, Martin had humility. Well, you have to have humility because uh, you are not your own. I mean, you're, once you make that commitment and uh, submit yourself to God's will, uh, then you are not in control. It's larger you than you You become are. an instrument. And you, because when you become puffed up, then you cease to be uh, God's instrument. And this is what people don't understand. And I put it in those terms because, uh, Martin was a religious man, and, and he was uh, an ecumenical symbol. Uh, he, he, uh, what he stood for transcended uh, race, uh, class, culture, uh, religion, you know, all of those artificial barriers. And so some people may call it something else. Uh, you don't have to be religious, you know, uh, but the fact is if you're moral, 
I mean, you find you found something that you could believe in. But it was this great symbol of of goodness and of uh, a symbol uh, of love. Love, I think, is so important. Who, who he had the capacity to love those who hated him, and that great love that he possessed emanated from him to other people, and and much of it was returned. That love transcended even continents, because when I travel abroad, I realize what great love people had for Martin, who never knew him. WTTW's John Calloway talking with Coretta Scott King in 1978. You can see that entire 60-minute conversation on our website. Back to wrap things up right after this. And that's our show for this Monday night. Join us tomorrow night at 5.30 and 10. Now for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, I'm Brandis Friedman. Thank you for watching. Stay healthy and safe and have a good night. Closed captioning is made possible by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, a personal injury law firm committed to giving back to the community through law and philanthropy.